Here we go. Oh, there we go. Here comes Rob Palmer. Hello, hello, hello from across the world, from Salinas, California, where it is 4.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, all the way on the other side of the world, almost, in Humpty Doo, Australia, we have Michelle Franklin, where it is 9 a.m., I believe. 9.03. 9.03 a.m. in the very morning morning, and we have... Mm -hmm. A chorus of baby ducks <laughs> in a swimming pool outside of her house that are swimming along, talking to each other, and it's adorable. And you got to look at the pictures on her Facebook page to see all the really adorable ducks that are out there. It's so cute. They <laughs> Can you hear them? The parents are yelling at each other. I can hear something. I'm not sure it's baby ducks, but they, they sounded adorable earlier. I was looking at their pictures and they're so cute. She's got a giant duck floating in there. And then oh, that's a toucan. Baby ducks. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's my daughter's daughter. inflatable toucan. Tucan. The ducks seem to Tucan. like it. So, Michelle. Yes. I was going to introduce you. So let me go over to my fancy, pantsy um, little uh, area here. Now, Michelle Franklin has been with the GSOW project for a very, very long time. And that's really kind of cool already by itself. Michelle joined um, the GSOW project back in August 2nd, 2014. Can you believe we've known each other that long? 2014. 2014. You came to um, the GSOW project from the Skepticality podcast. Remember that back in the day? Yes. I used to always do a lot of Skepticality. I remember you had a Skepticality ringtone on your phone too. I don't know. I you... have had that ringtone since 2012 and I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that song. The skepticality. Yeah, it does kind of tend to to go with you so um michelle she has um uh, usually i keep track of what it is that people say when they first when they join the gsw project how they how they introduce themselves to me and i don't have that on here because you joined back nice. in the day so mm -hmm. long ago i'd have to scroll way back to see how long ago it was that you um had uh uh, you know it was but it was 2014 which is a long time uh we started really i guess in about 2011 and 2012 so you're one of the first few that's that's pretty amazing and i was going to look up a couple things you have been with the gsow project and um you know really on and off more off than on <laughs> but, you don't mean to tell that part the one week the, the one Wikipedia page that you have written is uh, you spent an awful lot of time on it. And dear Richard Saunders, who I believe is watching in um, us today, he had a lot to do to help you to get this Wikipedia page in order by clarifying. And you rewrote the Wikipedia page for the Australian skeptics. Mm -hmm. and boy, was that a mess. It looked like people had just thrown things there. Like, you know what it reminded me of is, is a, a closet with <laughs> with many people living there and and uh, everybody just throwing their stuff in there and for some reason or other they just it, it was a mess and you had to go through it and clean it out and uh, uh, kudos to you it looks beautiful now and um i'd like to get more photos up on there actually so that yep. wikipedia page the australian skeptic wikipedia page that you wrote back in 2014 so it has been viewed you want to take a guess michelle I wouldn't Since have wrote a it? clue. I haven't looked back. You tell me. 52,224 times. That's a decent number. That's a lot of views. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting is that um, one of the things that I find fascinating is that the one day it had a spike of 800 views. Just one day. And I'm going to screen share this with everybody. All the crowd of people can look at the back of what we do here at GSOW and see, and see this amazing world of what we call Stat Badger. And you can see here's, a, here's the Wikipedia page views for the Australian skeptics. And you got this spike. Look at that spike. What happened that day? That's interesting. I think it was the conference. 
because oh, yeah, October of 2019, so right around there, there was views of 800, and then, yeah, that must be what it is, because look here on this one, if everybody can see, there's a 300 uh, view spike in October of 2018, I think, nothing in 17, and then here's a spike, and here's a spike, and here's a spike, so it looks like every time there's some kind of, um, the Australian skeptics are in the news, probably from when you you um uh when they do a lot of publicity because of the conference people go to the wikipedia page and get information and, and 800 people did in one day and i'd have to look at it in detail to see what was actually um you know what day exactly it was but it's great to know that people are going to the wikipedia page to get some kind of information mm. so another thing is we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different things with you Michelle thank you so much for joining me today because this is kind of fun I wanted to catch up with you because <laughs> we're old friends but you know there's a lot of information out there that I'd like to get from you okay I'm, I'm glad you've got plans because I have done no <laughs> preparation I have no idea what we're planning to awesome. talk about well I'm we're going to talk about your lead okay so we're going to talk about several different things and we'll go to any kind of questions if, if people have and of course this is being recorded live so it could, appears on our YouTube channel about time presents and it also will go on uh, I think it's going on Facebook right now um, we have a new person joining us right now Andrew Rawlings uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, people who are uh, joining and uh, watching this either now or in the future if they would um, you know they can like our Facebook page which is about time project and that way they can get um, notified when we're going to be doing another talk I don't have a set day that I do talks or a set time because I want it to be convenient for the person who I'm interviewing and because these go up on YouTube that's where we expect to get the most views actually so um, if they want to like our Facebook page so they know who we're going to interview next. If you have somebody in mind that you'd like me to interview, please let me know. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, a couple other things I want to mention is that we have, um, I don't know who I'm interviewing next. I'm sure it's going to be some something really interesting. I like, I, I have a lot of really interesting friends. <laughs> Richard Saunders says he's going to give me an interview here really soon one of these days. Uh, we do have a PayPal link on our website if anybody's interested in throwing a couple dollars our way or pounds, we'll take it. And um, there's a lot of other places out there that are doing skept um, like a skepticism in the pub kind of talk. The UK skeptics have a every Thursday at seven o'clock UK time, they're doing a lecture series once a week. And there's other groups that are doing this as well. I think a lot of people are having fun doing these on Zoom because you can have people in to speak at your local kind of local thing without actually having to pay for um, uh, you know a hotel or their travel costs or anything like that so everybody there's a lot to do out there don't be don't be shy about um, wanting to start your own channel so Michelle the first thing I want to talk to you about is a very very rarely talked about uh, operation that we did um, so you started with the GSOW project in 2014, yep. but you also were involved in the more guerrilla skeptic area. You were involved in the other umbrella group that I run that is kind of about stinging different psychics. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what you did with the first one, which was Operation Ice cream cone. Uh, it was ice cream cone was the yeah, first can one. Yeah, can you tell everybody a little bit about that? Because we almost never talk about that one. My my side of things was probably very different to your side of things. Um, from my perspective, it was a lot of embracing my inner crazy person. So I got to pretend to do all of the things that I assume other people do. Um and yeah, take on that role of, of a believer and, and talk the way that I thought that they would talk. And, and yeah, it was, it was quite interesting. So I took on the persona of another person. I can't even remember that person's name now, but I, I was somebody. Um, and I had a Facebook, Facebook page. Right. And because it was a different account to the one that I have now. It was a, 
I don't even remember. You're using Vicky right now, right? Yeah. Oh, shh. That's my secret name. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's only one Vicky on Facebook. I'm sure nobody will be able to Maybe find I was Vicky to begin with. I can't remember. But um, I was a crazy cat lady. It was fun. I was um, <laughs> posting pictures of uh, whatever I could find and, and offering blessings and, and peace to everybody and um, making lots of spelling mistakes and um, sharing lots of posts. And it wasn't so much about saying anything in particular. It was about building up that background and, and being a real person. So I spent, what was it, a month or two living this alternate life of, of this other person and um, pretending to be somebody that I'm not. And yeah, just providing that, that background so that the other characters, which were the, the ones who did the sting, had some real looking friends who they could talk to. So I was one of, one of your imaginary friends, I think. Imaginary friends. So this was a sting that we did in, I believe, 2015, 2014. It was right after we did Operation Bumblebee. It was our second one. And the idea was, I think with Operation Bumblebee, we spent six months preparing the Facebook pages and creating backstories. Mm -hmm. That was... Bef was chip I coffee. in Bumblebee? I don't think. No, I wasn't in Bumblebee. Oh, you were in Chip so Coffee. Was... And so what we did is we had a bunch of Facebook pages that hadn't been accessed from Chip Coffee. And we decided, let's try something else. And we did a phone reading. And we had Heather Henderson, who I'm going to get on and we're going to talk to one of these days, and Emery Emery. Um, they were blinded. Uh, Heather did not know anything about her character she was going to be playing. We called up a psychic called Tim Braun, B-R-A-H-N, and she did a uh, one-hour phone reading with him, and we recorded it, and she cried, and she did this, and she was just so emotional throughout the whole call. We gave her a tiny bit of information. I think we told her she had a son named Andrew. Does that sound right? Yeah, Andrew, yeah, her 10-year-old son or 12-year-old yeah, son. Yeah, something like that, and we told her, we're not going to tell you how he died. <laughs> You could you could figure out how he died, but that's who you wanted to be in contact with. And she, um, I think we told her just go with it. You know, whatever he says, go with it. But we, boy, we we put a lot on that page. Do you remember mm -hmm. you and the other people built thing. a story? I don't have anything to do with it, really. I mean, yeah, you guys was that did was it. one of the ones that you were locked out of, wasn't it? I'm so usually were, locked out of most of them because we don't want to have any interference. I know Heather was definitely blind. locked out because she was doing the sitting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember we created a whole story about how how he died and lots of his interests. And um, one of my big contributions was to make him a reptile enthusiast. So, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was we, we got lots of photos of, of various reptiles and put them up. And then we found some photos of kids about his age, you know, just arms holding a lizard and things like that and put them up. And yeah, lots of, lots of stuff that we didn't tell Heather about. So she didn't know about them. Right. And that was the just whole little, little pieces in the background. Right. That was the whole idea is that I think his next door neighbor had reptiles Oh, that's right. And, yeah, he used to uh, go over and visit the neighbor right. and feed the animals. And, and the neighbor stuff. died. Yeah. And um, the little boy's name is Andrew, I think. Yeah. And yeah. he didn't get to keep the reptiles in the house because his mom didn't like all that. So he would go over to the next door neighbor. His name is Joe or something. I don't know. And he mm. would he would do that. So we were hoping the psychic, I mean, there's no way the psychic, if, if the psychic had seen the Facebook pages, there's no way he could have missed it because we had a huge backstory for this kid and the mom and the next neighbor, Joe, and yeah, reptiles. So he, he had pets. So we didn't want to give him a cat or a dog. We did. You, it had you guys to be gave something, him, gave him lizards. something different. It was great. And then you'd had to put pictures up of lizards and things that were not necessarily. How did you make it so that the images weren't Google searchable? Um. Not that I think, I think some of them were my really photos, so I took wow. some photos that um, that weren't on the internet. So I just went out and took some photos, and I think other people provided some photos, and they they did stuff to them. They edited them and photoshopped them and changed them a little bit so that they weren't the same. Because mm -hmm. there were some lizards that I didn't have access to. There were a lot of like American lizards that 
that I can't get here. We and you trans- named That's one of the other complications is I yeah, had he to was in LA. Yeah, he had to watch to make sure you used American spellings. You had to keep deliberately misspelling everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know that whenever I'm playing a fake Facebook page, you know, and I have several fake Facebook pages that are just out there, just you have to keep them running, you know, so that they mm. stay like with a history. So, you, so every once in a while, you got to go in there and post something. I'll go to mm. YouTube and I'll grab a video of something, SpongeBob SquarePants or something, and put it up there and say, "Ha, ah, mm. this is so funny." I haven't really watched it or anything. And um, I know you had to, you had to name the lizards and things and. Yeah, something do you, like do you remember? I remember the story. I remember, remember why it was called. And, oh, go ahead. Uh, we cheated and signed up for a bunch of like daily horoscopes and things like that that would just automatically post to your page. So the days that I couldn't be bothered logging in and, and playing pretend, at least something would go up. And then you could go back later and look into your history and then edit the posts. So you could change it and, and make it say whatever you wanted to pretend to have said back then. Yeah, that nobody's going to go into that much cheese. detail. We called it Operation. And I gave my character a um, uh-huh. bad coffee habit and a sleeping problem to make up the fact that I was posting at the wrong time because I was in the wrong time zone and I wasn't always awake at appropriate times. We went to a lot of trouble and the darn psychic didn't read it. it no, it was so all bad. wasted, wasn't it? It was but. It, it was, was a good great. learning experience. It was a good experience, yeah, and it, it was hilarious because we don't know if they're going to read it. We didn't know if he would hot read or not, but boy, if no. he had, it was, but but he did really blow it because he had, I mean, he saw her son, and Heather has no children, let alone a child that's named Andrew. Uh, yeah. She said she had another child that was still alive named Emery, which was not that's Emery who was in the room. He had he saw all these things, right? I mean, he saw all these things that were happening in her life that were typical of a 13-year-old. I think, you know, he's out riding his bike and he likes hamburgers and cheeseburgers and french fries and pizza, you know, all typical things you would think of an American teenager living in in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. He said all those yeah, standard it was, things. It was all very generic, wasn't it? It was but at the same time, he said things that, you know, he said, I can see this and I can see that. And they were things that were definitely not true. Like mm-hmm. he was naming things, saying that he could see her son and she doesn't have a son and things like that. So, I mean, he did reveal himself to be inaccurate. He just wasn't hot reading. Right. Very bad cold reader. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it was, well, you know, it's hard over a phone too. You're not getting, you're only getting cl- clues from their emotions not, not um although heather was pretty emotional like she did a good acting job oh yeah she was really into it we called it operation ice cream cone because the idea was <laughs> i don't know where i came up with this but i i created this i said that his what he wanted to do is he has always said that he wanted to grow up and own an ice cream shop mm-hmm. he wanted an ice cream store when he grew up and so okay. your character and other characters acted like they knew the child and they would joke around and they'd say, oh, I remember Andrew used to tell me, you know, someday he'll give me free ice cream at his shop when he owns it. And that was kind of the st- reason, like you guys would RIP, rest in peace, Andrew. And I sure remember yeah. the stories. Yeah. It was a lot. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty developed story. <laughs> it was a significant chunk of our lives like we put two months into that or however long it was and it was it was every day every day we were talking to each other in these mm-hmm. fake names and I, I cannot keep track of who has which account like we've got it all written down but I can't remember so I was forming these relationships with people that I know don't exist and I couldn't keep track of who the real person was behind it and it doesn't really matter anyway because they're <laughs> only acting anyway yeah And then we had this other group where we all had our real names in it and we were talking in that one and I couldn't keep track of that either. (laughs) I mean, they're all just names. Like I've never met any of these people in reality. So it's like, well, that one's Heather. (laughs) Never met her, but anyway. Yeah, there was a Heather, but it wasn't our Heather. It wasn't the Heather the Witch because our Heather, Heather Henderson, didn't even have a clue what was going on. It was great. That's right. She wasn't in it. No, but there was a character named Heather. 
there was a there was a character named Heather. I remember that. This is why I get confused. <laughs> I don't blame you, but it's neat. And people don't have. I don't think people realize the amount of work and the time that's going in to create these backstories because they have to look realistic just in case the psychic wants to scroll back far enough and they have to have friends that mm -hmm. interact with them. So you guys would mm -hmm. go into another Facebook group, like a chat, a secret. Yeah, we Facebook had a little group, secret. And you would just sit there and go, hey, I just posted, I just posted secret. this. Can somebody back me up and say this mm -hmm. so that I can respond this way? <laughs> yeah. And then you had some people that had two accounts and they were having conversations with themselves, posting Our both puppets, sides yeah. of it. I was never organized enough to do that. I stuck to one person. So let's fast forward a little bit. You were also involved in Operation Pizza Roll, which was our most successful Pizza one Roll. against Thomas, Dr Thomas John. as the one where Mark and I went to um, see That him was the one person. where Jack sat in on the planning? Mm -hmm. That was Peach no, that was Pit. That was later. Peach Pit. So the first one was Pizza Roll. Because there's also Tater Tot. I remember Tater Tot. Well, Tater Tot, Tot is just where I've been writing articles about Tom, um, Tyler Henry. So that it wasn't right, a sting. Okay. So that wasn't an actual sting. That was no, just it went a... to Pizza Roll, which is the one with Thomas right. John. That was the one where I had a twin brother named Andrew. Yep. Who uh, had Andrews? pancreatic cancer. <laughs> I don't know what the deal with Andrew is. Yeah, um, I remember that. So you were also involved with that with the same character yeah. or another character? I think I think I've been Vicky the whole time. Um Vicky has changed personas a few times, but yeah, I remember um because you gave me vicky yeah it was mine was originally yeah because yeah, she's gift. a 10 year old account which is great because i'm getting memories come up whenever i check in there's like you know your memory from 10 years ago so i'm like oh better share that just to prove <laughs> and so it is, but. so people probably would like to understand that you know we these are used for different stings and maybe they have a different kind of oh i don't know maybe the the idea is you might if if we say we're going to do a new sting then and i need people to be in a certain location you got to go back and clean all that old history mm -hmm. hide it or uh something yeah. right yeah well you gotta you gotta be consistent um i've just recently moved vicky i i came up with this a, a new concept to get her into my time zone so so vicky came to australia recently to to um have a holiday and then when covid hit she decided to stay because she didn't want to go home so she's still here Aww. living with her new boyfriend that, that relationship's not going to go well but at the moment she's living <laughs> with her new boyfriend and everything's really good but um there's dark times ahead for vicky so um, <laughs> you can write yeah. a novel about this later <laughs> it's my alter ego <laughs> your alter ego vicky and they, mm -hmm. um, they interact with people. And some of the people on your friends list are not most part of, of this. Most of my friends are real people. Like Vicky just friends everybody. And most of the friends are real people. So I've got to be really aware when I post stuff, one, not to hurt people. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to be a dick on there and, and be offensive and hurt people. But I've also got to be careful not to promote too much crazy because I don't want to actually influence people Mm -hmm. in the opposite of what I'm aiming for. So mm -hmm. while I'm interacting with these people, I've got to kind of tone it down a bit as well because I don't want to start, yeah, contributing to the problem. That's, and and I cannot remember which of my friends are real and which ones are you guys. So I've got the list there and sometimes I check and I'm like, well, that person's not on the list. So that's probably a real person. <laughs> I've got a new boyfriend on the internet too, apparently. Um, <laughs> Does your yeah. husband know? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually told him I should tell and your him. children. <laughs> yep. Um, yes. He keeps calling me um, my, love. my love. I think I've sent him three texts. So uh -huh. yeah, it's a um, interesting one happening. <laughs> Maybe we could use it someday. And, and yep. sometimes the characters talk about very, I mean, one of the things I, I strive to make sure you guys understand, Stan, new people, you, you're, you're old established at doing this, but some people join the team and they want to carry, they want to run with one of the characters and we have to, sometimes I'll say, okay, we're going to be running a sting. It's going to last four weeks and, or this is going to be three months or this is a 10 day thing. You know, I'll give them a time limit and I'll say, if you have the time to run a Facebook character for that amount of time, you can create we'll give you a basic of what's going on and then you can go with whatever else you want, but we don't really want them to go way out there. Like with, mm. uh, uh, 
you know, really Careful not to overdo it. Yeah, you it wouldn't look like, like a real trying person. too hard. Yeah, right. So you could have a bad day at work. You could lose your keys. You could, you know, mm. the neighbors being really annoying by playing music too loud or whatever you. I mean, think sometimes I'll just thing. post a photo of a flower, like because that's the kind of thing I do on my own account too. If I see something that I like, I'll just post a picture and. It doesn't have to mean anything. It doesn't have to be important. It's just background to make you look like a person. And like several different psychics? Is that... I just like everything. <laughs> Vicky like, 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 like. likes everything. That's so sweet. And I've been writing Vicky's on other people's open, pages. a friendly person. <laughs> I write on pages and I'll say, you know, oh, this is so nice. Oh, I, you know, oh, your kids are adorable. You know, I really do. You're looking at them at winter time and the kids are out playing in in the snow and you, I'll write and say that, you know, that, you know, they look great, you know, they're having a good time or what fun or, and mm -hmm. I've interacted with some of the psychics too, Facebook wise. Mm -hmm. and that's really interesting because especially Thomas John, he doesn't realize, he doesn't know my account. He doesn't know which mm -hmm. accounts are me. I've been interacting with him and several of his main followers for a long time. They have no idea that they're interacting with Susan Gerbeck. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they can't figure it out. They're psychic, right? <laughs> yeah. I just realized I think... we have an Andrew listening to us too. Yes. <laughs> We've had <laughs> used to Andrew so many times on our. Yeah. I think they just don't, they don't bother looking into the history because they don't need to, like they can glean what they need from the last three days. Like mm -hmm. I remember early on, one of, one of the stings that we did that was actually a hit, I don't know which one it was, I remember telling you off and saying, no, Susan, don't do it, it's too soon, because you put it all together in about a week. Oh, and that, I was, that was, that was uh, Pizza Roll. That was our pizza most successful Do you remember me writing days. to you and saying, I don't think you should do it, because we'd only yeah. put a week of preparation into it. I said, it's too soon. We need to put more history into it. We need to slow down, this guy's going to have one look and it's going to be obvious. And I was completely wrong because he did not bother. He looked the last three days, completely hot read everybody, gave himself away. Like mm -hmm. the preparation doesn't need to be as thorough as we make it. So Yeah, skeptics I mean, overthink everything. We just yeah. overthink. But at the same time, we're ready for that one really good psychic who puts their homework in and and, and does the background research and checks because... I think you would struggle to, to out these accounts like with a bit of background research. They're pretty authentic looking. Oh yeah. I so, think I they'd mean, have we're a ready for trouble. that, for that genuine one that, that puts the effort in and really hot reads properly. I think if, if they were really trying to get a bite into us, like we were a wealthy person who uh, had a lot of prestige and maybe the psychic community or something that was going to really help. I think mm -hmm. they'd put a lot more time into finding and out. Who our if it's one of the, the big ones that can afford staff, like they might put somebody yeah. on background research and, and that person might really put the time in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, I think we'd be all right with those ones. Mm -hmm. I think that you think you're right. I think they wouldn't that. find much of anything. Uh, move on to uh, peach pit. That's the one that Jack hit was involved in. Oh yeah. Yep. Matt Frazier. Tell us yeah, about that. That was the one where you wore the shawl and, and kept... No, I didn't go. No? That was Kenny Biddle and Donna Biddle all... and the other four. Right. They're all blending in. They are all <laughs> blending in. I just remember you in a shawl dabbing your nose with a tissue and pretending to cry. That was a uh, pizza roll. I was crying with joy because we caught him. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we had yeah. him as he was yeah. reading me. I'm like, I cannot believe this worked dabbing yeah. it by eyes i can't believe this worked i cannot yeah, believe we got right. this are we recording oh so, god i hope we're recording i hope everything is, working. is the most recent one that i did isn't it mm -hmm. yeah i remember now okay that was one so of the peach pit, times i was still vicky right so the new york times uh reporter jack hit yep. knew we had successfully jack. got uh thomas john but what Jack Hitt said is that for the New York Times, they wanted him to do an in-depth article, but they wanted to see it done from beginning to end. They didn't want him just to just jump in and say, oh, it's all done. What did it, what happened? Yeah. We threw Peach Pit with Matt Frazier. The only reason we really needed to do it was because we wanted him to watch how it was prepped. Mm -hmm. uh, did he talk to you? Do you remember? Because he, yeah, yeah, he was in all of those planning meetings. So he was there asking questions all the time. I think I only actually talked to him verbally that one time when we had that big 
video call between all of oh, I wasn't was it video yeah it was video call remember I sat on the veranda at work and I showed you all the horizon by oh yeah yeah people. Jack was in that one other than that it was all just texting though and he was watching the whole time because he he had to set he was just in the background how did yeah and he was doing what research we were on doing. It. It made it made and it was really well done and he loved it he, he even went to Kenny Biddle's house because Kenny Biddle and Donna Biddle were the people we sent to go see the psychic, mm -hmm. hoping that they would hot read them. And they brought four skeptics with them. So there were six people who attended the Matt mm -hmm. Frazier show. And all six had elaborate backstories. I mean, there was somebody who had one person had broken up with the other one and they were going to hopefully get back together at this at this Matt Frazier show because they haven't seen her in a long time. And and I mean you guys had a massive history for these six people, right? Mm -hmm. Did you play one I of the characters? Yes. So my character ended up becoming one of those characters right at the last minute because mm -hmm. one of my old profile pictures is, I forget who, one, one of the characters, I got a photo of her and I put some flowers over it so you could just see like an eye and her mouth. So it was a little bit obscure but it was definitely her. And then I put that as the profile picture and she went as that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the yeah, other thing. We'll keep the, the Facebook four. pages going yeah. for a while and mm. then we'll, and we'll decide who's going to go to the event. Yeah. We don't want to make it too obvious, but mm. you know, kind of fitting the demographics of who it is. And here's the, another thing that I think that this is the hardest thing and people don't, I'm sure don't know this. But like you said, the last three days is probably all the psychics going to look at. Mm. So, so what I'll do is I'll make a timeline. I'll say, okay, we're starting now. Everybody wake up your, pay, your, your accounts and start making them live. And, you know, and then on this day, you know, by maybe a, a week ahead of time before we're going to attend an event, Let's make those accounts start having a backstory. You know, either they're having a fight mm -hmm. with their husband or their, mm -hmm. their child is, you know, doing something awful or somebody's health is really bad in, in their family. Something, whatever it is, mm -hmm. should start happening about a week out and then slowly have it happen so that everything that's posted on the Facebook page is within the last three days. So mm -hmm. that when the psychic is tempted, it's Mark calls it like throwing bacon out there to him, you know. So when the psychic goes to the Facebook page, they see, they get the gist of it pretty quickly. And then they, they can just go back a few days and they can say, oh, got that one. And then, you know, they can write it down in their little paper and, or whatever they're mm -hmm. doing, make their notes and say, okay, this one had a father-in-law who's been really sick and he's, you know, I don't know. And then they can, mm -hmm. they, they know what it is. And somebody's, somebody's, uh, somebody's birthday was this day and I don't know, whatever, yeah. whatever story you put up. I remember one had just quit smoking the year before. So we made it an anniversary. It was one year without oh, smoking or something like that. That's clever. Or I think, no, that wasn't deliberate. Someone posted that. Oh, that was operation and, pizza roll. And, yeah, and we didn't like, even remember smoking, smoking, smoking. Who mm. smoked? Mm -hmm. It was just like an, an old thing from previously and he'd gone right back and found that. Mm -hmm. It was a life event. One of those mm -hmm. things. Okay. So let's go fast forward to the very end. Okay. So, so whoever goes to the event has gone to the event. The recording is done. We have audio, hopefully maybe video, but definitely audio of the entire, the entire event. Mm -hmm. And then we give it to you guys and we say, and we watch it all and again, then what happens? Again. What, what do you guys do? Uh, we trawl through it for things that we remember because you guys can't do that if you don't know what we've been talking about. So we just watch these videos and yeah, look for things that look familiar and then try and find them in the history of our accounts. You like with screenshots. We watch the psychics again and again. It's great fun. <laughs> Oh, it is a lot of fun. And, you know, we could always use more people. So if anybody's watching this who wants to do it, you know, I'm going to vet you because I, I don't want to have any <clears throat> anybody join our team that's, uh, uh, you know, believes in psychics or anything like that because, well, actually, we do have somebody on our team who believes in psychics, but mm -hmm. she's the wife of, of one of the people who's, yeah. who's pretty prominent. It took me a while group. to realize that because mm -hmm. Stuart kept saying, oh, yeah, I'm going because of Angela. And I'm like, 
why aren't you going? Because he's like, oh, she likes to go. It's like, well, I like to go too. And it took me <laughs> ages to realize that he was telling me that she likes to go because she she believes, believes in psychics, it. right? But yeah. she and and whenever whenever Stuart was saying, he was saying that. Um, you know, we're going to put on this sting. And she says, I want to help. I want to help. And I trusted her enough to do it. You know, I, I know her. And she she's said, she's great because even oh, though she great. believes it, she still helps us. Yeah. And she said, she said all along, she was thinking to herself, the psychic's going to see right through you guys. Mm-hmm. She, he's going to look at these profiles and go, Oh, that's yeah. not who it is. And then when it didn't happen, she's like, well, <laughs> how come they didn't know that you guys were fake? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that would be. <laughs> I'm hoping that if she sticks around long enough, eventually she'll change her mind. She'll I see all this fun. evidence and it, it's, it's fun. Hopefully. So, let's, so let's go to something else. Cause I think this is, this is, oh, you know, I, I think it's fun. So you're in Humpty Doo, Australia, mm-hmm. which is right. Yeah. Near I'm actually Darwin. just a little bit outside Humpty Doo. Humpty Doo is about a 15 minute drive from here, but it's okay. our nearest post office and shopping center and all that sort of and thing. And the next so. biggest town is Darwin. Uh, yeah, so there's a few towns between me and Darwin. Um, I work in Palmerston, which is about a half hour from my house, and that's about a half hour outside of Darwin. So Darwin's about an hour from here. Right. And so you're at the very top of Australia. Mm-hmm. Like Indonesia is really close to you, right? Yeah, like yeah. We so we're much closer to Indonesia than what we are to, say, like, Brisbane or Sydney or any of those places where we're right up near. Yeah. Our, our cheapest holiday destination is Bali. So that's, that's where you go if you want to have a cheap, quick holiday. Although I've never been there, but yeah, that's our, <laughs> a little across the quick across the um, water and there's your holiday home. And you go but, over to Bali. Mm. So you have Humpty Doo is famous for something. The infamous, infamous poltergeist of Humpty Doo. Tell us about Humpty up. Poltergeist. I love oh. this story. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think I'd be an expert on it now because I've talked about it so much, but I actually had to go back and brush up on it. When you, when you put it in that little thing that you shared the other day, I was like, oh, I better go read about the Poltergeist. You've been again. interviewed about him by the media. Yeah. Um, ABC Darwin. Zone. Haven't you been on the Skeptic Zone talking about the Humpty Doo Poltergeist? Uh, yep. Yep. Years ago, that was my first interview with Richard. <laughs> was the Humpty Doo poltergeist? That was what, 2014, 15, 16, somewhere around there. I don't even know. It's been somewhere while. in the past. It's always Humpty Doo poltergeist. So the um, the the way that I became the contact person for that was um, via Facebook on one of our community groups. Someone mentioned the poltergeist, and half the community started talking about it, and and half the people were saying, yes, it's real. And half the people were saying, no, that's dumb. And I chimed in and said, hey, all you people who are skeptical, why don't you come join our Darwin Skeptics group? And the ABC um, reporters, which I have learned multiple times now, if you put stuff on Facebook, they're always lurking, looking for stories. I found out yesterday, I put some photos of my ducks on. So they're going to do a Facebook post about my ducks. So ABC Darwin... um, get a lot of their stories through Facebook. Um, they contacted me and said, do you want to do an interview about this Humpty Doo poltergeist? So I did that. And then about a year later, they were interviewing a lady who was doing ghost tours all over Darwin city. Um, so they brought me back to do that again. And once again, we ended up talking about the Humpty Doo poltergeist. And there's a guy called, uh, Tony, hang on, I've got it written down. Tony, oh, what's his name? Tony somebody. Tony Healy and Paul Cropper wrote a book about poltergeists and that sort of thing. Tony actually rang in. Um, he lives down south somewhere, but he rang in and I got to have a good argument with him on the radio about whether or not the, the Humpty Doo poltergeist exists or existed. Um, tell, tell us the story. What, so is what it? happened was, I think it was 1998. So um, mm-hmm. before I came to Darwin, there was a house in Humpty Doo that had uh, paranormal things occurring. They reported it to the 
I think it was Channel 7 or Channel 9, one of the, one of the big um, TV channels that had just happened to recently start up a new Darwin chapter, Channel 7. Mm-hmm. Richard's giving me hand signals. Um, <laughs> Channel 7 had just started up a new chapter in Darwin or in Perth or somewhere, a new regional chapter. And that just happened to coincide with this new Humpty Doo poltergeist. So that was very convenient for them. Um, and they went out and they investigated. They brought all their reporters. They brought um, a guy from the local church. They brought a guy with a thermal camera. They brought um, this Tony guy. Um, he came out and, and investigated. Unfortunately, they didn't let the Darwin skeptics in. So there was a, a different wow. group of people back well, then. Well, you would have scared Darwin the skeptics. poltergeist away. Well, apparently they were a bit Negative offended. Negative energy. Because the, um, the Darwin skeptics went in assuming that it wasn't a ghost and they were waiting to be proven the other way around. That was a bit offensive. So they didn't wow. let them in. They only let in the, the religious folk and the, um, the reporters who were promoting their new um, TV channel. So unfortunately that's who got to do the investigating. Um, and we heard lots of great stories. There were um, giant objects flying through the um, room. There were, um, things falling from the sky. There was all this great activity happening. All caught on video, right? A lot of these people saw it. So um, Tony Uh um, said that he saw a lot of these things occur. Uh Unfortunately, the video only ever captured the really small things. So there was lots of little pebbles falling down. There was some shards of glass that that just kind of appeared out of nowhere and flew through the room. there also happened to be some ceiling fans in that room. So, I mean, oh. make that what you will. Like, like maybe it. the kind that have like a, like a broad thing on it. So that when the ceiling fan turns on, see, like it spins and maybe if something was on top of it, it might like fall off. Can you see there that ceiling fan? Oh. Every house in Darwin has about 20 of those. <laughs> and the only reason that's turned off is for this recording. Like they never they're never not running because it's always oh. hot. So you could put winter, something on hot. there that was kind of sort of anchored on yeah. there. And then I mean, maybe it's going to fall of off. Dirt on there with some mud, maybe a bit of sticky tape. Like there's so many ways. Um, some of the Darwin skeptics actually tried to replicate it and they had no trouble replicating it. Some of the TV. Wow. That doesn't mean it wasn't true. It and they couldn't. So yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that they did report was when they finally did let the Darwin skeptics in after it was all off over and everybody had left Mm -hmm. they had a look at the ceiling fans and they were clean and um coming from someone who's lived in darwin for quite a while ceiling fans are never clean that just isn't a thing that happens i clean mine probably once every month or two and the next day they're always dirty i mean you wouldn't be able to see it here but there's always a line of dirt on that leading edge and it appears within days of cleaning so they're never clean unless you cleaned it that day Rob is showing us his ceiling fan. Ooh, We're going to have a, a one. conversation on ceiling fans now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the fact that they don't they're have one here. We don't have that here. That they've had to try and remove something, whether it was a bit of sticky tape or some whatever was holding these things on. I'm imagining mud would be good, something that dries out. So you put in a bit of mud, put your rock on top. When it's wet and tacky, it would stay. And then as it dries out, it would lose its grip. But I mean, they didn't let anybody in that that was going to be looking for that sort of thing. So nobody knows. Does anybody live in the house still? I mean, now? Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, I found out yesterday I've been to the house next door. Um, I never knew the address of it, but I Googled it yesterday to brush up and I found the address and I looked it up and um, I've actually slept in the house next door to it. Um, I rented a house once and there was no electricity for the weekend. So I went and stayed at a friend's place, which is next door to that one. Didn't see any ghosts. So... No pebbles or, or anything materializing in the middle of the night. You would think the psych no. I get, the poltergeist stays in that house. It doesn't go to the neighbors and throws. Yeah. Big things sure. falling like what? Like a big safe or like in a car? No, no. Big things like, like, like this Pianos. big. Like I think there were some plates and stuff. So, but they were never recorded. They were only seen. So they had video cameras and they, they videoed pebbles. There were some bullet casings or something like that. So just little low profile, small things. Um, Yeah, nothing big was ever recorded. There was one video that showed someone in the background doing this right before one of them appeared. (laughs) Could have been a coincidence. Uh, Yeah, people are always doing that. (laughs) 
right? Yeah. You never know. You might, yeah, somebody could be doing that right now. And yeah. the, <laughs> so is it, this has been a few years. So the people who live there now, are they reporting any activity? I have not heard anything new. Awful quiet. Like huh? I've been, see, I moved to Darwin a few years after that happened. I've never heard anything like current, um, but the story keeps coming up. So it came up last year. Somebody posted about it and talked about it. And then a few people chimed in and said, yes, I've seen poltergeists, but not at that house. But yeah, we haven't, haven't had any more big poltergeist events since the nineties. Oh, darn. I, I would mm -hmm. love to have poltergeist. I think that would be. I'd like to think 50. that if it did happen again, they might actually let some of the, the current Darwin skeptics come. Like we haven't done any proper investigations up here. We might. It's a, not the most no. um, active group that we have up here, but if they were to find poltergeists again, I'd, I'd like to think they'd actually let some of us go and have a look like last time they didn't. Mm. Um, Tony challenged me on the radio when I was talking with him and he said, well, I hope one day you do get to see it. I wish you'd been there. And I said, well, you wouldn't have let me in because yeah, back at the, on the day when it happened, they didn't let us in or well, them in. So yeah, I'd like to think that, if it does happen again, they might be a bit more open and let a few more people in, but I don't have high hopes. Well, the that. media is um, now knows who you are and you're the go-to person, right? So um, I was for a while. One time I was busy. I couldn't do it. So Richard stepped in for me and he did an interview for them. Um, and they haven't asked me again. I think Richard might have upstaged me a little bit. Ah. Uh... <laughs> Well, you know, so if a UFO lands in the area or something happens, then they know who to go to if it's a paranormal. I'd like to think so. And it's not just me. I mean, we've got our, our group here. There's a, um, it's a small but um, dedicated group of skeptics. So there's about four or five of us who talk to each other regularly. We've got a little group chat that we talk in regularly and share stuff. And then in the public group, there's about... 200 or so people that that regularly just post random oh. things that are happening and um i think rob posts in it quite often he has his um, regular posts that he puts in that he puts in all the groups so yeah we've got we've got regular activity there um and then we've got our smaller little group of people who talk about it more often regular activity unlike the poltergeist yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's let's switch again i want to talk to you about some science stuff okay so the first thing i want to do is i adore your little girls i've been watching <laughs> them grow up over facebook i you know you and i have never met in person we've missed each no. other i've been over we got really close to meeting one time i nearly went to the brisbane yeah, the conference in um, 2000 conference, and then I got a job and it got in the way and I didn't end up going. But we you would have met in person if I'd gone to that. I feel like I know you already. So it just feels like, so your little girls are absolutely adorable. And the things they do, you have them doing are so, I mean, you're not one of those moms that's like so worried about, oh, you have to be clean and you have to do this. Like the kids come in and you got a picture of them holding a snake or something. <laughs> I love it. It's so wonderful and fresh and I don't know the life they're leading. I mean, they got ducks in the, in the swimming pool. They can go swimming with the ducks. So tell me what it's like. How do you raise kids to be science nerds? You know, I mean, what is it you're doing? You think? Um, I'm not actually actively doing anything to turn them into science nerds. I'm just being one in front of them. Um, they're, they're developing their own personalities and their own interests. And some of the stuff that they're interested in has no interest to me. <laughs> um, I don't know where they get it from, but um, yeah, they're developing their own. I'm just showing them what I do mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're developing their own interests by watching that. So yeah, I haven't put any effort into planning how I'm going to, turn them into what I want them to be. I'm just kind of feeding them and keeping them generally clean and letting them do <laughs> their them thing. And, and it seems to be working out. I've got um, a major advantage of where we live that we get the opportunities to, to interact with nature so much because that's mm -hmm. just part of where we are. And we're not unusual for our area. Like everybody in this area has snakes on their veranda and ducks come and visit and that sort of thing. Like that's just, 
part of life here. Um, do you think that you have a, a above just, average science department at the schools? Or, I mean, are the kids, do you think they're just getting um, normal science education? We happen to go to a school that has a really good, um, what would you call it? It's a really good, it's not really a program. It's just the whole school is very um, geared towards um, environmental stuff. So they've won a few awards for um, green activities. They have their gardens. We, uh, there was a TV show that they made a couple of years back. Um, it was like Rubbish Warriors or something like that. And they visited three different schools in Australia. So there was one in Tasmania, one in Perth and our school here in um, Berry Springs. And, you know, the kids made gardens and they built little um, automatic waterers and things like that. And they worked on water conservation because their old sprinkler system was dripping. Um, and the kids just get to be involved in that. They had a thing called uh, Moth Mob. And there was just a group of the kids that all studied moths and they wrote a little book about moths and it's just part of their their everyday life that they get to study animals we've got a pet in, a stick insect here that we just we found it on the veranda and we kept it and it had babies so we kept the babies and then they oh. had babies and we've had multiple iterations of of stick insects now we name them all after various um actors who play um the doctor because it keeps regenerating every season so our current one is Jody. We're not sure what we're going to call her babies because we're kind of running out of names now. But um, yeah, one of Jody's babies is living at the school. We gave them a cage and the kids do all the work. I don't do any of the, the husbandry. The, the kids do all the work. So they look after Jody and go collect her eggs. She lays about five eggs a day and it's just part of their job every morning. They've got to feed the chickens and collect the stick insect eggs and yeah, it's just chickens. It's just how you have life chickens for them. Chicken. Yeah, we've got um, chickens, so that's why we have ducks because they like our chickens' food. So they come and steal food from the chickens, and swim in the pool. Um, we've got dogs. We've got a snake. Um, we've got lots of frogs and a turtle, and yeah, lots of wildlife, which is good. And yeah. Mostly oh, frogs wow. in the in the garden because whenever the frogs lay eggs, we always take them and put them in buckets and raise up the tadpoles and then the frogs just hang around. So we've got lots of frogs on the veranda, which is nice for them. The veranda sounds really busy. <laughs> There's a lot of animals hanging around. That's fascinating. I, I Now, I read a book. It was an audio book. I just got it free, I think, on Audible. And it was about the territory. It was a murder mystery, you know. But they had all these characters and they sounded like Crocodile Dundee. And, and I was listening to it going, this is where Michelle lives? This is weird. I mean, it, was, it sounded really rough and it sounded like the outback. And like I said, they had these people with these thick accents with, you know, I thought, whoa, what? We don't have accents. You have accents. We're just not normal. <laughs> That's a good one. But it was yeah. interesting to to listen to um uh you know these these stories of these people that are there and and um I I just really was like wow this is this is great. I mean they had lots of people going out into these fields far far away and there was a little interaction with each other and then there'd be like these homes and then there'd be a home next to it with grandma and then the great grandfather's over here and they're all like a, like a compound or something. I thought wow. Is it what it's like over there in uh, Humpty Doo in mean, Darwin? It sounds normal. I mean I don't really have anything to compare it to like <laughs> yeah so I mean we have areas that are the city. So Darwin City is probably no different to a small city in America. It's just a very small one. So our, our, I think our total population is like 150,000, something well, like that. I'm not sure. There's not town. a lot of people. Um, so Darwin City itself is, it's a, it's a normal city. People live in houses and then they have a very small backyard and then there's another house. Um, and that's what a lot of the cities down south are like as well, but I live a little bit outside that, so we have a bit more space. So my house is on 20 acres. Most of that is just natural bush. Mm -hmm. um, in my area, every block is 20 acres, so that's normal. 
Uh, in Humpty Doo, most of the blocks are about five acres. Um, sometimes crocodiles show up, like it's not common, but I mean, I had a friend who had a crocodile in their backyard and that's, I mean, it's the kind of thing where if it happens, you jump up and down and put it on Facebook and go, hey, look, there's a crocodile in my yard, but nobody says <laughs> bullshit. Like that's, that's normal. So tell me, um, you, I've never you had are, that. You are, you are a crocodile, you're like, that was your expertise for a few years, right? Tell us about um, you and crocodiles. I wouldn't say I was ever an expert. I was very, very interested. So when I moved to Darwin, it was for the purpose of, I wanted to be a crocodile expert. I never quite got there, but I worked with them quite a lot. So I worked for, I think, three years at a place that was partly a research facility, partly a zoo, partly a farm. So my job was um, looking after the crocodiles. So we had a few thousand babies, so I had to go feed them every morning and clean them and that sort of thing. Um, Did you have to brush their little teeth? Um, I actually gave a crocodile a bath once. We um, <laughs> we caught one of the big ones to sell to, I think it was going to Sydney or somewhere, might have even been going overseas. Um, and we had to wash it. So we tied it up and, and laid it on the ground and we got big brooms and buckets of soapy water and we, we washed the crocodile and hosed it off and sent him off. So I mean... They do get dirty, and sometimes if you're if you're putting them in the mail, you've got to wash them. Um, <laughs> it's not something that they do regularly, but we did do it once. Um, where I work now, we work in I work in weed management. We have a quarantine zone where the um, there's weeds in the water that aren't allowed to spread, and sometimes we pull crocodiles out of there. And if they go to a um, a release so some of the crocodiles go to farms and and some of them get killed but some of them get released again you can't spread the weeds but the crocodile's been swimming in amongst the weeds so we had to wash that crocodile before oh. he could be released so i mean i wouldn't say brush his teeth but yeah have washed one. <laughs> um oh my but yeah my job there a big part of my job was just doing tours so i'd take tourists around and yeah, you, know, you hold the bit of meat on a string and get the crocodiles to jump and, and that sort of thing and just talk about them, which was fun. I like to talk about animals, so that was a pretty a pretty fun little job. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. I, <laughs> I would be such a wuss. I would show up there and I, I would be like, oh no, I am not getting near that thing. That is scary looking. But, you know... They're not scary as long as you don't put yourself in danger. Like in America, you have animals that will actively hunt you down and kill you for food. Like we don't have that. We, we've got a lot of dangerous animals, but none of them are actually going to attack you. The only time that you're actually in danger of a crocodile is if you put yourself in that place where they feed. So just don't go to the place where they feed. Don't swim in their water. Don't stand at the edge of the water. You're not in danger. Yeah. Well, what about the drop bears? Oh, no, they'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> do you have hoop snakes up there? Yep. Yep. They're real too. Yeah, they're real yep, too. We, we heard a lot about hoop snakes when we were in Australia <laughs> this last time. Well, I already heard about drop bears and I forgot to tell Mark about drop bears. Mark Edward, when we were, we were in Melbourne, then we went to Brisbane, uh, Canberra, Sydney, um, and to, um, the Gold Coast and then to Brisbane. Mm -hmm. That's what we just did that. And wow, it feels like 10 years ago, but it was only 2019 Christmas time. But, you know, yeah, with this like COVID thing ago. that's going on, it just feels like everything was 10 years ago. And we were in Canberra and somebody, I forgot to tell Mark about drop bears. And so mm -hmm. they were talking about drop bears and Mark was like, drop bears, what are those? And we said, I think they kept with a very straight face. Lauren Green, she's the she runs the um, camera skeptic. She's with the very straight face. She's like, oh yes, drop bears. And, he, and Mark goes, well, do they kill a lot of people? And she goes, under a hundred a year, I think. It's hard to know because you don't find the bodies. Oh, really? Yeah, there's hmm. never any evidence. They're just gone. They're gone. Well, we went up to see uh, in Brisbane. They had hoop snakes. And what we heard is that they jump at you and they attach themselves around your neck and they strangle you. And uh, I kept yeah. asking people all around the shops and stuff. I'm like, do you have any hoop snakes? Have you seen any hoop snakes? And they had never heard of hoop snakes. 
Yeah, um, to be honest, the only person I've ever heard talk about a hoop snake is is Americans. Um, <laughs> I think there may be a conspiracy going on, um, but but I have to I have to toe the line and agree that yes, hoop snakes exist. Yeah, um, we do have some snakes that are aggressive, but only if you make for the mom you put yourself in that position. Them. So say your mommy wears army boots, they might get a little aggressive. <laughs> what? Your army mother boots. wears army boots. That's a joke. You haven't heard that. That's, I guess, that's an American colloquialism. No. Oh my goodness. Um, but no, if you <laughs> if you come into the personal space of a brown snake, they're quite aggressive. Um, they do actually jump a little bit. Like they they rear up and and if they're feeling threatened, they'll actually leap forward and and try to scare you off and if they bite you, you're in big trouble. Like they're highly venomous, but I mean, I've never been attacked by a snake. Like you walk through the bush, you make a lot of noise. They go away. They, they don't want to interact with you. Yeah. I mean, we've got them here, but they don't, they don't attack you unless it's their, you know, their only option. So you don't quietly sneak through the woods then, right? No. That's no, not a good idea. Quiet. There's also, we've got wild pigs here and you don't want to accidentally step on one of them. You want to make a lot of noise so they go away before. I've gotten pretty close to them. I hit one with an ATV once. I was driving through long grass and hit a pig and it took off and I got a big fright, but they're not dangerous. They just run oh away. My goodness. So tell everybody what you do. You work in an invasive species, right? Yeah, invasive species. So at the moment I'm working in weeds, um, doing biocontrol of weeds. Um, I saw someone put up a question before about cane toads. I used to work with cane toads a um, long time ago. I was um, working in a lab out at Fog Dam, which is a really nice um, wetland area. It's a, um, it was created artificially by damming a river and they tried to grow rice there and that failed because the geese ate all the rice and various other things but um we ended up with this really nice wetland area and there's a couple of scientists who have been there forever mm -hmm. taking records and and monitoring this area and um cane toads arrived after they'd already started monitoring so there's a lot of before and after research on the impact of the cane toads so i got to work in that lab for a number of years um helping with the experiments there, which was really good. We looked at um, different control techniques for toads and uh, impacts on the native animals around there, the um, impacts on the ecosystem there, which was um, really exciting. Um, we managed to develop a trap that actually works. So there's a lot of people have designed traps. Most of them are completely useless, but we did manage to create one trap that works with a pheromone. So we did lots of work on different pheromones and which ones attract the toads and which ones repel the natives hmm. and came up with a, a chemical that basically will draw in cane toad tadpoles and repel native tadpoles. So you put it in this trap and the natives steer clear and the, the cane toads swim in and get trapped. Hmm. So that was very fun and exciting. So cane toads are a huge problem from what I understand. I I'm sure mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about them on the skeptic zone. They're a very, um, very visible, very hated toad. They don't even come close to comparing with cats. So a lot of people hate cane toads and will go out and kill them and hunt them. And actually a lot of people are really cruel to them. They think it's funny to kill them in horrible ways, which I am incredibly against. Um, but the impacts that they have are, are localized and nowhere near as bad as some of the other problems that we have. So cane toads have reduced population numbers of most species that eat them, but most things recover as well. So over in the East Coast, where they've been there for ages, most animals have recovered a bit. So there's still cane toads there. A lot of what happens is when they come in, all of the animals that tend to eat them die, all the animals that don't tend to eat them don't die, and then they breed up and you end up with a population of animals that don't tend to eat toads anyway. So mm -hmm. th there's usually a bit of recovery that happens. As far as I know, no animal has gone extinct due to cane toads. There was a lot of concern about quolls for a while, but they're definitely not extinct. They're still around. 
Um, there was a lot of population reduction in the large goannas and some of the larger snakes were eating them and their populations went right down, but they're not gone. They're just, they've gone down a bit. Uh, usually the bigger animals can eat the bigger toads, so they're gone, but the smaller ones don't eat them or they eat smaller toads and they don't get as bad a dose of the poison. But I mean, you compare that to cats, cats have caused something like a quarter of, of all mammal extinctions in Australia. I mean, That's Santos interesting to think none. that there that cats are an invasive species. I really had never thought of that until I cats I'd read are the some of your most posts. invasive species. They're on every single continent if you include the pet cats in Antarctica. Um, they're incredibly successful, incredibly adaptable, mm -hmm. um, and they're everywhere. And they're um, they're really good hunters. And I mean, in a country like America, where you have native cats, it's not such a big deal because all of your wildlife has evolved to deal with, with cat-like predation. But in Australia, we don't have cats normally. So our animals have evolved to evade the predators that we have here. And then a cat comes along and the animals don't know how to avoid it because they're just, they're not adapted to that sort of thing. So when a cat comes, it just decimates what's around it because their hunting style is so different and their, their techniques are so different that our wildlife just can't handle that. Hmm. You know, you're a, you are a um, reporter for Richard on the Skeptic Zone. You've been doing that for a while, right? Mm, yeah, I think we're well over a year now. Not what sure. kinds of things do you report on? I mean, I hear you all the time, um, but um, tell the listeners what you. you so my report. my theme is is wildlife. So um, my my interest is is ecology, invasive species ecology, that sort of thing. So I try to to stick to topics about wildlife. So I've done one on cats and I've done one on horses and I've done one on cane toads and various things like that. Um, but I've also just done some on random things that happened to be pissing me off at the time. So I did one <laughs> on um, rock stacking. I don't like when people go out into the wild and move all the rocks around because it destroys uh, microhabitats for the, the animals that live there. Oh, interesting. Huh. I did one on quarantine, uh, just because I know a lot of people don't understand why we all flipped out so much when Johnny Depp brought his dog. Oh, in, I remember so that one. I, did one on that. I remember um, that story. That was a really good one. I it really hadn't done. I mean, he thought, you know, oh, no big deal. Mm. And you explained. But I think I think that's going to be different now because people are learning words like like um, contact tracing and exponential and you know words that that haven't really been in the in the public conversation lately yeah. after COVID, people are starting to learn a bit about how um, diseases move and, and how uh, quarantine works. So, I mean, people might have a bit more respect for things like that in the Maybe. future. I remember Hopefully. seeing a cartoon on Facebook. There was the two students sitting in an audience and there was a person at the chalkboard, you know, professor, and they're writing this, you know, quadratic equation and, and had a bell curve on it. And the two people in the audience and the students were looking at each other like, we're never going to use this. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. well, well, they are really using it now. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really important, these statistics and bell curves and, and mm -hmm. you know, X, Y, Z, X and Y, all that stuff. It's all, it's all, I'm watching it on the news and I'm going, oh, hmm, hmm. you know, I was never a really big math student, but I am understanding it it's 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 in my dna somewhere somewhere in my past i do remember paying attention to some math class somewhere and it's like yeah. oh i get that you're right i you think know, there's a lot of things starting that, to learn yeah that people just don't have to know about so i did um biosecurity training a few years ago just because i work in government they train a whole bunch of us just so that we're ready to respond so i did all the the biosecurity training learned how to suit up in those fancy suits and, and go onto properties and take samples. Uh, and we, oh, Richard's saying something. Four years. Four years on the it. skeptic zone. Wow. Wow. You said it was That's a impressive. year. I'm telling you, time doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we learned how to do all that stuff. And um, we had an outbreak of a disease here, uh, citrus canker, that, that affects the citrus fruit. So it's harmless to humans, but it, it affects fruit production. So I got deployed on that, which was fun. I got to leave my regular job and go be a citrus canker inspector for a few weeks. And we 
every property we'd go, we'd put our little suits on and we'd walk in in our gumboots and take samples off the trees and interview the people. And then we'd go and we'd have to walk through the, the chlorine bath and, and take oh. our suits off the right way and do all that sort of thing. And we learned things like how to do contact tracing and, and um, how to manage an incident. Um, and in weed management, we've, we've used the same system of um, incident management. So I've had a little bit of experience in that. And it's been really eye-opening to see that play out on a broad scale. So you, you see how whole nations are managing outbreaks of disease the way that we out manage a little outbreak of a citrus disease. It's um, fascinating to see the similarities between what we do and what they do. And it's on a whole different scale, but it's the same processes and the same training required. And I just really like the fact that everybody's seeing it now. Everybody's seeing how these processes work and what needs to be done. And I think maybe in the future, if, if I do it again with something small and, and I try to explain to somebody why I'm taking their orange tree away. Mm -hmm. You can, can use say, the look, COVID example. Look at, look at what you saw happen. This is why you can't have your oranges for a couple of years. And, and once the disease has been eradicated, you can have your oranges back again. And, and that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people are starting to respect that, um, that need for quarantine a lot more. So and, how, how is it being affected over there? You're, you're not seeing much of anything. No. So Australia in general did really well. I think there are about 7,000 cases or so. Um, but the borders got shut down fairly early and the social distancing seemed to work quite well. I think we do have a general advantage in having a lower population, but in the cities like Melbourne's probably not got that lower density compared to New York. It's just um, the, the, the number of giant cities interacting with Melbourne are probably a lot less. Um, but I think we had a lot of advantages there, but the, the things put in place seem to have worked. I think we're down to about 400 cases in Australia. In Darwin specifically, it never really happened. We had 29 cases, I think, but they were all people who came in with the disease already. So there was no, no spread within the community, no, um, no transfer at shopping centres or anything like that. So we did do the response. We all um, started washing our hands religiously and um, disinfecting shopping trolleys and all the pubs got closed down and all the um, nail salons got shut down and all that sort of thing. So we did do the response mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it, would, it just worked. So most of it's stopped now. We can pretty much go back to life as usual interesting it's it's just totally different from america <laughs> totally we, different. we definitely had that advantage of having the lower population but At distance between think, each other and i think you yeah, guys just took it, it was it also seriously. handled really well yeah it, they took it very seriously so our chief minister which is like the head of i mean we don't live in a state we live in a territory which is a little bit different but effectively the head of our state um shut down everything really early on he shut down borders um, introduced mandatory quarantine. So anybody who crossed the border had to go into a hotel for two weeks um, and um, they were just forced into quarantine and it worked. Ever since that happened, we haven't had any more cases show up. So mm -hmm. the only cases that have shown up have been people who were diagnosed somewhere else, but they mm -hmm. came back because this is where they live and they came back and went into quarantine and got better and that was the end of it. You know, I uh, I didn't really grasp the idea, you know, people were complaining in America saying they couldn't go to their vacation homes and people were really upset about it. And they're like, well, it's so safe where, you know, I'm going to go to my cabin or my, you know, I'm going to go camping somewhere and I'll just be by myself and I'll be just fine. And then the um, governor of Michigan, she explained what was going on and she says, that in the southern Michigan, that's where the the cases are. People are sick, and there's it's it, it's it's a problem. So what mm -hmm. what she was worried about, what the medical people who do virology were worried about, is people saying, "I'm going to go to my property in the Great Lakes area, which is you know a many hour drive away. And they're going to have to get their boat. They're going to have to get all their provisions. They're going to have to get all these things and drive up there and 
if they stop along the way, then they're interacting with people. If they um, wait until they get up to the area and then go into the grocery stores and buy all their stuff, you know, and ice mm -hmm. and all that stuff, gasoline, it's, it's, the problem is, is that they're coming from a southern area that has a lot of cases and they could be in, um, oh, the word just escaped me right now, they, showing no signs. They can yes. have no signs at all. Asymptomatic. And, and be, yeah, and they could be a carrier or somebody in their family mm -hmm. could be a carrier. And here they are taking it up into this little town, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe getting gas, stopping at, the, stopping at the local store, getting a sandwich or whatever they're doing in these small towns that don't have, you know, they, they're, they know each other. There's not a lot of outside strangers coming in and things. So mm -hmm. they may not have the precautions set up with people wearing masks and the hand washing and the, you know, hand sanitizer. And so the, their little community of maybe 100 people, 200 people may have somebody come in. So, I mean, if somebody could transport themselves with like a beam from Star Trek from one place to the other, and they lived in that little area for weeks with totally self mm -hmm you know, on their own without having to go to the grocery store, without having to go to a restaurant, without having to go get gas or propane or whatever, that's fine. But it's just getting from place A to yeah. place B and then having to interact with these people who may not be prepared and they don't have the hospitals. Um, and I think that's where areas. we got it right here. Um, places like Sydney that had the initial outbreak that, so they had a fair few cases in Sydney and then there was more a bit later in Melbourne they haven't bothered locking their borders because that's where the disease is, but it's all the clean places that have locked their borders. So we locked ours and we did the quarantine thing. Mm -hmm. We're free to go to Sydney if we want and that's fine. But if we come back, we've got a quarantine. Hi. Yeah. I'll come to Sydney one day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you want to come back, you have to quarantine and yeah, it's not about, stopping people from having their holidays it's it's stopping that risk yeah. of what might happen on the way to your holiday so there's a camping mm -hmm. site that i like to go to um up here it's about a day's drive to get to it um i was supposed to be going this june um and we cancelled our trip because to get site you have to go through an area of aboriginal land that is full of communities and these people are really vulnerable they're living in close quarters with each other a lot of them are susceptible to this disease and if you break down on the side of the road they're going to come and help you and right. then you're going to interact with them like i might be able to say all right i'll drive straight to my campsite and i won't interact with them mm -hmm. but i mean if my car breaks down they're going to come and help me aren't they that's right so, and mean, you might have to go pee on the way and you're going to stop somewhere yeah. and you're going to have to go to the bathroom someplace and your exactly. kids are going to be like mom dad you know i need to get out and yeah exactly you, you and, it, and i mean what's the benefit it's a huge risk if you drive through these communities and put these people at risk the benefit is i get a nice camping trip like it's a bit selfish to think that i should risk that person's life so that i can have a nice holiday and go fishing right so and i don't think people realize it i don't think people mm. it even dawns in them the, i uh, I see people on social media, you know, just all upset. Why can't I just go camping? And you're like, mm. well, go in your backyard. Like you did the other day, you guys camped out in your front yard or on <laughs> that your was, veranda. That was more me being lazy. I keep promising <laughs> that kids are camping. We're going to go next weekend. Um, but yeah, they're a bit spoiled for camping up here. We can, we can do it pretty much anytime we want. Um, but yeah. I didn't feel like it this week. So we did it in the backyard instead. I think it's great. So let me yeah. open this up for questions. Let's get the, let's get the, um, uh, if you guys want to unmute yourself, if you have a question, I know Andrew has one. So Andrew, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, ask um, Michelle. Are you there, Andrew? There he yes, is. So I, um, uh, but I, uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle's covered the answer. It was about cane toads. Yeah, you don't want to. Any. You don't want to expand. Oh, yeah, we definitely have them. No, but you, your kids oh, are me. Raising yeah, we. Toes. Well, I don't know if I should say it on on <laughs> on the the live recording, but we um we shoot them. Oh. Um. Yeah. I I like <laughs> I like to control my ferals, but I like to do it in a kind way. So I don't want to cause them pain, and I don't want to cause death. them suffering. Um. We we have guns in our house because we like to go pig hunting and that sort of thing um and also because we have scary dogs come in sometimes so we have the the 
opportunity to do it in a, a humane and, and harmless way. So once every couple of months, we'll put the spotlight on and the cane toads will all come out and we'll go around and, and yeah, one bullet through the back of the head and they die instantly. Oh my God. <laughs> a good way to practice your aim. Oh um, goodness. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, a lot of people out there that will tell you to put cane toads in the freezer and that's kind of the accepted oh, way to cruel. do it. And it's, it's really cruel. Like putting, yeah. putting a live animal in a freezer is a horrible way to kill it. So, I mean, I always tell them if you don't have, I mean, if you don't have access to a kind way to kill them, um, a, a good option is to put a pair of sunglasses on because they can squirt venoms, uh, poison. So you don't want to have your eyes exposed, close your mouth so that they can't get you in the mouth and then just put a shovel through the back of the head. Um, if you've got the, the guts to do it, it's instant, it's painless. I mean, but just to be clear, you weren't saying put sunglasses on the animal, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, don't put sunglasses on. I sunglasses mean, little, on little little cane, cane toad sized um, sunglasses. Yeah. I mean, cane toads are really harmless to humans. <laughs> the only way that you're going to get hurt by a cane toad is if you are in the process of killing it. They do have the ability to squirt their poison. If it gets in your eyes, it'll be really irritating. If it gets in your mouth, it'll 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 poison you. It won't kill you, but it'll poison you. If you were to eat the cane toad, you'd probably die. But um, you'd have to eat a few of them. Like they're not, they're not like being bitten by a snake or anything. So oh as long God. as you're a little bit sensible, like I'll quite willingly just go outside and pick them up. Um, if they're in my swimming pool, I just pick them up and move them on, push them out into the bush, unless I'm having one of my little purges. I just kind of <laughs> you have your revolver. Leave them alone. Time. I think Richard has a question for you. I was just about to comment that uh, when I was a kid, around 40 years, 40 years ago in northern New South Wales, we would go out in the summer, I guess, most nights with a bucket and hunt cane toads. They mm -hmm. were a pest 40 years ago. And when Michelle says they can, um, they spit or project venom, that's not like a, a funny Australian story. That's real. That's no, not that's like real. drop bears, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite the same. But I, I, don't, I never remember feeling worried or scared about that aspect of them, but they were just so, they were just everywhere and they were a real nuisance all those years ago. And what did you do with them when you put them in a bucket, Richard, or do I not want to know? Well, they were dead. <laughs> after, after We kill them. Oh, you kill them and then know, pick them up. Oh, I see. Kill them quickly, like Michelle says. But I, what happened to them after that, I honestly can't remember. Probably in the they compost. They make good fertilizer. The do yeah, they? Probably. In the garden. Yeah, bury them under a tree. But if, if oh, people are interested, they can Google cane toad. And there was a documentary made oh many years ago, which is a very good ooh, documentary ooh, on. I know the one you're talking about. I was in it. Oh, um, oh you were in a documentary so, about cane toads? No, there was a documentary a long time ago called Cane Toads and Unnatural History. Something and it was like made that, yeah. like in the 70s or something. It's really funny. It's like a... It's a documentary and it's truthful, but it's comedy at the same time. And about 10 years ago, no, it would be eight years ago because I'm pregnant in it. Um, eight years ago, my youngest is eight. Um, no, it'll be 11 years ago because I was pregnant with my oldest. So she's 11. Um, they made a sequel to it. It's 3D called Cane Toads. The conquest. Uh, yes, so this wasn't like Sharknado or anything like that. Where I mean, it's similar <laughs> level of of corniness. It's really kind of it's silly and it's um it's a bit out there, but it's also accurate. So like they interview real scientists who are working on. It. So they came to the lab that I was working at and they interviewed all of the like the leading cane toad researchers and and um. My role goes for about one second. They got everybody oh in the lab to just hold an animal and smile and go, easy <laughs> grin for the camera. They told us that they were going to do it Brady Bunch style and we were all going to be standing there holding an animal and grinning. Um, but they didn't end up doing that. They just like went one after the other. So there's about a second of me smiling at the camera holding a lizard. It was um, my claim to fame. But that movie is in IMDb. So I think that means that, I mean, I'm not in the credits or anything, but. You could add yourself to the IMDb. You can edit yourself. That's yeah, you could add yourself. Which is why it's but not, not a reliable credited. source on Wikipedia. Oh, you yeah, just do I'm it anyway. Credited, so, oh, well, 
I was random face number two four six. <laughs> no, Michelle Bill has Franklin done... plays random face two four six. Michelle's <laughs> yeah. done many stories now over the years on the Skeptic Zone. The easiest way to look is to go to skepticzone.tv, click the episodes link, and you'll find a search panel. Put in Michelle's name, and you can see all the episodes where she's uh, been a reporter. So organized. I might do that. <laughs> so organized. I wonder how many I've gotten now. It's been so much fun. You know, Rob Palmer, who's on, who's sitting here with us right now, he joined GSOW because he was listening to the Skeptic Zone, and I guess I talked about GSOW. And Rob is in New Jersey, Calif um, California, New Jersey, uh, United States. So it, you've got listeners, Richard, all over the world listening to your golden Good. tones. I've been listening to the Skeptic Zone for years. Even in well, Argentina. You're on it. Yeah, well. Argentina. 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 Yeah, he's got listeners. Fact, all you're over. on the episode that I just put out about four hours ago. Oh, you know, Michelle was involved in right. that slightly with the um, Jeanette Wilson. Um, so the New Zealand skeptics, uh, one of their members, Russell, just kind of asked me, he, he said he's been getting a lot of emails from one psychic healer that he had gone to see once and he kept getting emails from her and he really liked us to do a sting. And he said, he mentioned, oh, well, she's going to be doing... Um, something tomorrow night and i'm like well we could put together something in a day <laughs> and i'm like texting michelle michelle do you have a character that could do do a sting tomorrow <laughs> she picked the one night i couldn't do it too she's like oh it's going to be 5 30 in the afternoon on thursday and this was like wednesday, wednesday. afternoon she yeah was asking me and i'm like um can we do it next week? She's I'm like, no. no, the psychic has got it on this day. And the really funny thing is I told the New Zealand uh, Russell, I said, hey, Russell, what time would that be in California? Because, you know, I've got a character that's ready to go. It's, she's fresh. She's ready. She's, you know, updated. And, and you know, I didn't want to bother anybody else in America because I knew the time difference would be a problem. And he said, oh, it'll only be midnight when you when you do your you know, when it happens in New Zealand, I'm like, oh, midnight, I guess I could do midnight. So it's supposed to go from midnight to two. And then we get to the day and he's like, I did the time difference wrong. It's actually going to be one in the morning when you get, when it starts. So one till three in the morning. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. Because I had to be up at seven the next morning to do, I had another Zoom call interview and I said, oh my gosh, okay, I could do, I felt like crap. I was drinking doc, uh, caffeine all day. Um, and then about six o'clock, I, I crashed. I, it was like I hit a brick wall. <laughs> it was so awful. I, felt so I find bad. sometimes the time difference can be an advantage though. Like some of the things that I've done with you, I've had to get up at 2am to do it, but it's Is better right? because uh -huh. or it's better because I'm not busy at 2am. Like Often the things in Australia <laughs> are happening better to do it while I'm at work or while uh -huh. I've got to be feeding school run or something like that. So 2 a.m. I'm generally available. So, I mean, it'll make the next day suck, <laughs> but I can actually do it. And I mean, You guys all heard that. Internet. I have her on camera and video saying that she would definitely do something at 2 in the morning for us if we put something else on. Okay, so she has nothing. <laughs> Just make sure everybody knows it. And we do, we have just, people all over the world and I'm glad we do because you never know what you're going to do in different time zones. And there's always someone available. Mm -hmm. you text them around <laughs> and say, Hey, who's, who's got, well, one of the characters Daniel in New Zealand was going to use was a character in California. And I, um, I said, you should play this character right here. Cause so what we'll do is we keep a spreadsheet with everybody's password and email and login. Mm -hmm. And we don't like to go from America to Australia or Australia to America too much because sometimes there's a lot of problems with Facebook, not allowing us to, to move that because that's kind of odd, but, um, well, they I have went, trackers and stuff and they know if you've logged in from the wrong place right. too many times. Exactly. So you have to be careful. We can change their names, but I think we can only change names on a character. Do once you remember that day once. that we spent about an hour trying to answer the security questions <laughs> on one of the accounts? That was you and I, wasn't it? That, that was in the cane toad lab. That was back when I was working there. <laughs> I was sitting in the lab surrounded by cane toad tadpoles and I took my hours lunch break 
and we logged onto the computer and tried to answer all these security questions about a fictional character that neither of us could remember who she was. And you were posting, no, I was posting a photo because I had the account and I'd put up a photo and you'd look at it and go, oh, I think that's Carol, maybe. <laughs> and then I'd have to click from three different people and say who it was. And I think I got too many wrong and that whole account got locked down. Oh, it was, but yeah. Uh, we tried. We, we tried it. We try to keep it all in the same, we try to keep people with the same time zones and, and all yeah. that. So it's nice to have a lot of characters. We've, we've, we've yeah. added a bunch of Twitter accounts. So we okay. could do Twitter if we wanted to. Um, I suppose we could do, <laughs> I suppose we could do um, Instagram. But Facebook really allows you to spread your wings and let you, you know, tell a story. It's easier mm -hmm. than like a Twitter. But we could bring somebody in with a Twitter. Um, <laughs> we could bring somebody in who has an account on Twitter. When we do uh, Project um, Operation Lima Bean someday, uh, we're going to need some extensive work. It's going to be a lot of problem. But the one we did just the other night, Operation, it's called Operation Purple Pinecone pie o-p-p-p -P -P. that's what we're His calling names are getting weirder. <laughs> well she kept going through her she would take this um you know Jeanette was doing these uh she says well I want you to imagine I don't know it was a chakra or something she was imagine it it's like a pine cone and she had I think she had a pine cone and she put it up on her forehead and she's like it, it's like a pine cone and I thought Oh my gosh, she kept talking about this pine cone thing. And I said, Oh, we got to call it Operation Pine Cone. But it doesn't fit because I have pine food. cones. Pine cones well, are edible, aren't they? Pine cone pie. Like the, the seeds out of them or something? You could grind them up, I guess, and use them for, mm -hmm. for some kind of meal. But I wanted pine cone pie. You guys put weird things in pies. Yeah, you guys don't. You have meat pies, right? No, we do pies fruit are pies. Meat. Fruit pies don't. No, well, I mean, apple pies, but no. Pie, pies are meat. So when you say pie, if I said, yep. Michelle, would you like some pie? You, yep. You're immediately thinking meat. Yep. Oh, that has to be a British or Irish thing, maybe. Is that why originally? Probably. I don't know, but I, I never pie, think of, I maybe. never think yeah. of meat. I always Me think neither. of fruit no. or chocolate no. or vanilla. No, the only exception may be like, they're chicken pot normal. pie, maybe. Chicken pot a pie meal. is good. I had one on Thursday. I was out doing field work, so I wrapped a couple of frozen pies in foil and put them in the engine bay of the car. Oh, that's a good that idea. Was my lunch. And yeah, they cooked. It worked pretty well. A bit of tomato sauce on it. Well, Australia. And now they're, they're in the chat. People can't see this if they're watching it. In chat, they're making fun of me saying Australia. They're you saying do talk a bit wrong. weird, Susan. <laughs> well, my Sorry, kids have always said I add an R to everything. So... Yeah. <laughs> And it, you know, it's yeah, actually, funny. my name is just Albert. <laughs> <laughs> Not Rob, huh? It's Albert. Well, my mom is from Arkansas, and so she's Southern. And so they, people will ask me, they'll say, what part of the South are you from, Susan? I'm like, I'm from Salinas, California. There is no South here. I'm in the middle of the state, nothing South. And they're like, no, no, you must be from the South. And I'm like, no, I'm from, and it's the R. And my kids, my kids would always, um, their friends would be like, if I was driving the kids around or whatever for whatever event, you'll hear them in the giggling in the back of the seat. And one of them will say, what's, what was the state that's right north of uh, Oregon? Miss, and, and I'll say, and I know they're trying to get me to say Washington. I know they are. <laughs> they have so much fun with it. I can't hear myself say it incorrectly. Well, we're the opposite. We don't say ours unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> really? So if it's at the beginning of the word or if it's required because Americans can't understand us. Otherwise, ours are not something that is spoken. <laughs> so we are, we're speaking two different languages here. I notice um, Richard sometimes inserts a few ours into his words. I think it's just to make some of the audience a bit more able to understand. Uh, that's, that's because I, I'm a frequent visitor to the United States. Oh, so yeah, sometimes I too. will actually pronounce the E-R in a, more of an American accent, but I think that's subconscious. That's just habit. Wow. I, see, I did not realize that. When I first met Richard at PsyCon, I just, I thought he was faking being an Aussie because he spoke so perfectly American. 
<laughs> Especially no, no, if you no, remember, no, no. it was right next to Stuart Jones, who I met at the oh, same time. Oh my gosh, Stuart Jones. I can't Jones. understand every second word. See, that's the opposite thing. You guys yep. don't pronounce your U's. His name is, name is Stuart. Stuart. Uh -huh. I didn't hear Stuart. you say any difference there. Say it again. There's a U in there, Stuart. Stuart. Well, that's how I said you. it, Stuart. 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 Say it again. Stuart. Stuart. How am I saying it wrong? <laughs> This you, is going to make such fascinating playback when people watch this on YouTube, you know, Susan. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got to pronounce the U's, but not the R's. Stuart. So, so Susan Stuart. says it like S-T-O-O-R-T. -O -O yes. And, and, <laughs> and Michelle says it like it's got a W in it, which some names it's more Stuart. Like a y, is, I reckon. Deborah knows me very well. So how do you say it correctly, Deborah? Deborah? Stuart. No. S T U E R T. Stuart. Stuart. I don't even hear the difference. Stuart. Stuart. <laughs> I had to practice. It's like when you guys say can and can't. Can and can't. Can't. Uh huh. You can't. don't pronounce the T's either. So you say can't. both words are the same. Can't. can't can't I can't go I can't go what do you mean I can't go well, if you say it quickly if you say I can't go you don't I say the T I, well I wouldn't say I can't I say I can't. <laughs> no but the way you say it, you say it quickly you don't say the T then you're saying exactly the same as can so you say I can go or I can go. oh nonsense well I because can't, I can't go to the here store. I can't go to the store I can go to the store you need somebody from store. Boston here that, that <laughs> Well, people were making I fun of me because I don't, I couldn't do Melbourne, Mel, Mel, Mel Melbourne. Oh, that's a funny one. Melbourne. Mm -hmm. How do you pronounce that? Melbourne. 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 That doesn't sound like right Brisbane. 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 A couple of years ago, I went to um, the Carolinas, which is on the East Coast, and we were in this town called what I would say Greenville, but they call it Grenville. <laughs> Oh, I don't know that one. Greenville. Yeah. Well, we have a large city in New Jersey, which has the airport, so people are familiar with it, which is Newark. Newark. Right? Uh huh. There's a city spelled the same exact way, about equal distance south of me in Delaware, but they say Newark. I always thought it was like Newark. Arkansas Newark. and <laughs> Arkansas. There's another one that's. Oh, don't get me started on that one. Spelled the same? <laughs> well, now I know because I am my mother is from Arkansas, that it is a, because of an indigenous um, tribe or a uh, group of Indians there that say Arkansas, not Arkansas, which is how it's spelled, Written. Arkansas. Yeah. But it's Arkansas yeah. because of the, the native. The way they there. pronounce it. Yeah. Is that why Illinois is also spelled, pronounced funny? Compared how to should it be spelled? That's There's from an S on the end. Illinois? It's like Dubois. I mean, it, Illinois, I would say, should have a Y on the end, just going by how you say it. Well, it's spelled, the last letter is an S, right? So it should be Illinois. Yeah, it's because it's it's they're, they're annoying. <laughs> Illinois. This conversation could go on forever. Right. <laughs> well, let me, just, let me just add, where I live, a good chunk, maybe a third of the population speaks Spanish. So I, if I see a word and I can't spell it, I mean, I can't pronounce it. I've never really heard it. I almost always say it in Spanish, like it would be Spanish. We have a street here. It's P-A-J-A-R-O. And I remember when I was a kid, some people came up beside me and they said, we're trying to find Pajero. <laughs> Pajero? We don't have a Pajero. Yes, it's right around here someplace. I'm like, Pajero? I have no idea. And then they draw, drove off and I realized they were talking about Pajaro. Yeah. So it just yeah. doesn't even, you know, every, yeah. everybody's got their own little niche thing. But, yeah. but like Richard said, we shouldn't be talking about each other's accents because we're all in this together. <laughs> it's <laughs> fun. That we are different. It's always fun to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sound know. different. Fun. Yeah. So anybody have any nice questions for Michelle before we, before we vacate this absolutely fun, very fun um, talk? No, it's final. It's uh, nice to finally see you uh, in person though. And I didn't even realize who you were until you started speaking. And then I immediately 
recognize your accent and, and uh, the report you've done on the skeptic zone. Nice. Yeah. Some of the other women I can't tell apart interest. Yours is a little bit different. Yeah, that's one of my There's problems. a lot of different accents in Australia and no, <laughs> it's hard. No, there are, but it's hard to tell them apart. I, yeah, there, there are a lot of different accents and a lot of different sounds and they're just very similar, but very different. I can't, I can't tell the difference between an Australian and a New Zealander. And I would probably add in the UK too. I, I, South Africa. Did, did you South notice Africa. that that woman whose video you posted yesterday was not a New Zealander? She's from Manchester or somewhere in the UK, I believe. Somewhere in the UK. It sounds like oh, she's, she's, she's not native. Right. She's a, she's no. a great. Read her Wikipedia know. page. She's from the UK, but I, yeah, so I her accent is very much not New Zealand. I couldn't tell you for nothing. Oh, let's talk really quickly about the Australian Skeptic Conference. It's supposed to be in um, the Gold Coast this year. Um, mm -hmm. Mark Edward and I were in the Melbourne, 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 Mel Melbourne, ben. Melbourne, ben. Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne. That's it. You got it. Melbourne, Melbourne. If I say it really fast, I got it. The Melbourne uh. conference in 2019, this last December, which was a freaking blast. And Mark's first time in Australia, my second time. And we went all over the place. It was so much fun hanging out with everybody, but boy, was it hot. Oh my gosh. Canberra was, I thought I was going to die in the smoke was so thick. But well, so, right. on the fire, huh? oh yeah, and t didn't that seem like it was like five years ago or something? Yeah, I thought it was at least last summer, but of course that would have been winter. So yeah, it was our winter. So so did you um? So what, what do we know about the Gold Coast skeptics? Let's plug them real quick. Yeah, all right. Well, as announced on the Skeptic Zone today, the episode that's just gone out, the Gold Coast skeptics will be presenting Skeptic on the Australian Skeptics National Convention from the 23rd to the 25th of October this year, online. Really, online. all of it's online? online. Yep, no. so everybody, no matter where you're listening to this or watching this, you can now join in on the Australian Skeptics National Convention, see all the talks, have uh, join in all the fun of the Bent Spoon Award and all that sort of stuff. For more oh, information, uh, go to Skepticon, dot org dot au and, and all the information will be up, up there with a k and uh, keep an eye on that so that's coming up in october and we're all looking forward to that regardless of how they present it online in person we'll all have a good time yeah i'm really I'm actually a little bit happy about it because it's probably going to be the first conference i get to go to oh that's that's true you haven't been to any that's too far right. away well, um, the New Zealand skeptics, from what I understand, that was going to be held in uh, Wellington. Oh, my gosh. I had a lot of fun at the New Zealand skeptic conference as well in Christchurch. Uh, Mark Edward mm -hmm. and I got over there a little early, and we spent a week in Christchurch. What a beautiful city. It's a city. It's a garden city. So they have a, a botanical uh, garden that was incredible. Christchurch was just an amazing place to go to. So um, I believe they're having it in Wellington this year. And the last I heard, I think they're still going to do it in person with some call-ins. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody out of state, nobody out of New Zealand is going to be there. Mm. Richard, you were going to be there too, weren't you? You were asked to be a speaker in Wellington this year, right? I think so, but yeah. you know... The world has I reckon they're going to so open much, that border so. pretty soon. They're talking about opening the Australia-New Zealand border yeah. shortly, which I'm really hoping happens because my cousin is getting married and I want my Omar to come over from New Zealand and, and come to the wedding. So. Where's, where's your Omar at? Where's she at? New Zealand. She lives in Wellington. And Wellington, yeah. I haven't been there. Mm. That looks like a really nice place to go to as well. Mm. I, I've We've been privileged to be able to go um, through the skeptic community to be able to go into these areas that I would probably not have traveled to before and meet and hang out with people that are part of the skeptic community, which is a really strong community and uh, so varied. I mean, we even have crocodile hunters and cane toad killers and <laughs> <laughs> things I would never have thought of. It's so interesting. And, um, you know, it's a very welcoming, open community and it's great, you know, and, um, uh, Richard and I spoke at a conference together in Queenston, Queenstown, New Zealand. Yes. 
a few years ago. Yeah, Queenstown. Uh, three years ago? Wow, what a wonderful time. You we were had. We deadly had ill, but what a yes. trooper. He was so sick, but he got out uh, and he did his thing. He did his talk, and then he went to the, the gala dinner, and he bent spoons for people and interacted and did recordings. And, and then afterwards, he's like, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> Don't feel awful. It was, but it was... It was some of the best fun I've had. I mean, online Zoom calls like this, fantastic. Do it as much as you possibly can, but there's nothing like going in person and meeting up with people. It really is sharing a sharing a drink with them, um, you know, going down to breakfast with people, and everybody's so welcoming. And and at least in my in my world, everybody's and there's always another place at the table, you know, for for. Um, coming and hanging out with me um, and if we can't then maybe we'll start another table and <laughs> we'll, we'll try our best to crowd everybody in but I, I i think it's so much fun to meet each other oh richard's putting uh, up of, right. of us together in uh christchurch no no queenstown. um queenstown which yeah. was another beautiful place but heck expensive wow what a beautiful place so um it might be 2021 till we all get together again Hopefully somebody in, hopefully Australia will ask me to come back out again and New Zealand will ask me to come back out. We're missing so much here and I've had to cancel, I think seven talks in 2020 because, you know, mm. we're supposed to go to Italy, we're supposed to go to Calgary, um, Canada, um, New York, Washington, DC. DC. DC, Washington, DC, Washington, <laughs> um, uh, Skeptical, which was going to be in Berkeley. Oh, yeah. I was going to get to speak with Mary Roach. She was going to be To there. me, it still feels like there's been more going on because all of these things that get canceled are now going online and suddenly I can go to them all. Yeah, Zoom is amazing, isn't it's it? Been a, it's been a much more active few months for me because all these things have suddenly become available. Mm -hmm. yeah not when somebody like so you have, away have to do you mm -hmm. have a little trouble getting around raising two kids and and having um, a full-time job and having to patrol your stick stick bugs whatever they called stick insects <laughs> stick insects i mean somebody's going to stay and take care of the stick eggs insects mm -hmm. right so you can't right. quite you're from brisbane right yep that was a beautiful city too. I mm -hmm. loved it. The history there is incredible. I just, just love. I just love all that. Even the drop bears. <laughs> <laughs> We've been lucky so yep. far. All you right. Would have loved it at my house when I was growing up, Susan. We actually had a koala that lived in our backyard when I was in Brisbane. No way. Um, and I'm sure you've heard that chlamydia is quite common in the koala population. Oh. Our koala, his name was Warren, um, had chlamydia. And every time he got a little bit sick, he would go back into the koala hospital and get treated. And when he was better, he'd get released again. So he was totally tame. So... <sighs> We could just go outside and pat him. He lived in the tree outside my bedroom window. And yeah, whenever he crawled down low enough, we'd go and give him a scratch behind the ear. And, and Cuteness alert. Cuteness yeah. alert. And so your it was not so fun when another koala showed up because they scream at each other <laughs> and it's really, really loud. Um, I may have hosed him once when I had a test the next morning and he would not shut up. Um <laughs> But, and hosed yeah. isn't an Australian euphemism for like shooting, is it? No, no, he was okay. <laughs> he was our friend. Uh -huh. We looked after him. I didn't actually oh, hose him. I have, I, I have um, a koala let question. The mist she has a koala a question. I have a koala yep. question. So, what are they like when they're not tame, other than just staying out of your hair? In your the hair. trees, they're beautiful and they're far away and they're harmless. Do um, they drop on you? <laughs> no. Um, if you ever try to pick one up, though, they are vicious. So um, the only way to hold a koala safely is by the hands. So you can't, like, you pick them up like a cat. They'll, like, grab you and bite you. But if you hold their hands, you can, if you stand behind them, the trick is you get a, a blanket. I mean, don't do this. But you get a blanket and you put the blanket over their head like a muzzle and then cross it over behind their back and then grab their hand. So you're standing behind them, their head's covered and you're restraining their hands. So you go two fingers around the hands and then the other three grab the feet 
and hang on really tight because they're strong. And if you grab them like that, then you can stuff them in a bag and take them down to the koala hospital. But the, <laughs> the face is dangerous. The hands are really strong. That's where their strength is. And to pick them up, you want to pick them up by the hands because that's where they're, they're built to hang from their hands. So they can, you can pick them up by the hands and it doesn't hurt them. So any other way, you're going to get hurt. Um, I heard a funny story about some Japanese tourists. I don't know if it's true. I choose to believe it's true. That um, found a koala on the side of the road that had been hit by a car and it was unconscious. So they grabbed it and put it in the car and they drove it down to the hospital, but it woke up partway through and yeah, trashed the inside of the car and they all got oh injured. Oh my goodness. Quite, people, um, people are going to listen to this video and they're going to get all the way to the end and they're going to go, Oh my gosh, I learned how to pick up a koala. <laughs> but don't do it. Don't do it. If don't you do see it. a koala, you you need to. just ring the phone I, number and experts will come and pick it up. I don't think I'll ever get an opportunity to, to put that into yeah. practice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> most Australian animals are harmless until you touch them. If you touch them, you're in trouble, but just don't touch them, you'll be fine. This is why. In the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I'm going to show you my nerddom, is that you always have to have your towel. You need to know where your towel is. And if I feel underneath my desk, I will find Another use my for the towel. towel. Is to wrap up a koala. Yes. <laughs> I always know where my towel is because you I'll never you know. You might have to pick about, up a, a koala. Um, I'll let you in on a secret about Australians, and Richard can probably confirm this. I don't think it's just me, but we all have towels and pillowcases and um, blankets in our cars permanently. Look at <laughs> that's how you rescue wildlife. There's there's always something that well, needs to be saved. Richard, so. you don't think you're going to have a wild life? You have. To to rescue in your office to you he was pointing Henry, at the ceiling before what's Henry up the ceiling? No, the, no the skeptics uh, on cats they come here i have to cats. rescue no i'm rescued from them sometimes <laughs> <laughs> i love those cats they're great yeah you you never know when you might have to rescue a wild animal so and it might be a koala mm -hmm. or a drop bear we don't have koalas in the north oh they can't live here it's they go moldy we don't have sheep either. No sheep. I don't know if that's actually the reason. That's just what I tell people. No, it's too hot. <laughs> so there's no sheep. There's no koalas. There's All no rabbits wool. either. Yeah. We don't have rabbits in the north because they can't ovulate. the The temperatures here don't get cool enough for rabbits to ovulate. Oh, so wow. we have pet rabbits. You can keep them in your backyard as a pet. But if you want them to breed, you have to put them in the air conditioning because it's too hot for rabbits to breed. <laughs> So down south, rabbits are a huge problem, but yeah, they can't live in the wild up here because they can't breed. If they escape, they'll just die of old age and never breed. <laughs> the things you learn. <laughs> this, is, this is all good information. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Deborah. Deborah and I are on the same trivia team in, um, in Monterey. We go, well, we were on the same trivia team when we were able to meet in human in person. So it now- might be years. If we get that question that, you know, I bet you we might get a rabbit, a rabbit? question. Yeah, yeah but trivia yeah. questions don't talk about Darwin. Darwin doesn't well, we exist just say outside that... of Australia. They'll talk about Australia in general. They won't talk about Darwin. Aww. They might talk about rabbits, though. And ovulating. They can't, they can't breed unless they're cool enough. They can't yeah. breed. So in the southern area. states, they are a massive problem. There's millions of them. But yeah, it's just because that, it's yeah. colder down there. Hmm. I don't know about that. Well, I need to end this. This has been okay. fascinating. And Michelle, she wanted me to tell everybody that, because I asked her if she would do one of these interviews with me. And she said, sure. And then I said, and then she, then I made, I think I made the announcement that she was going to be on live. And you guys, yeah, it was during in. the announcement that I learned what you actually wanted. <laughs> that it was going to be live and that there'd be Q &A and A and that we'd be talking and there'd be video. And I'm like, Oh, come on. It's just you and I. We'll be fine. <laughs> it was really interesting, Michelle. What I, I agreed to was a phone call with Susan that she might record and then edit later. <laughs> no, so. I'm not bothered with that anymore. That is beyond oh, well. my, my, well, I could do it, but it's just, uh, no, we don't have the time for that anymore. So let's say goodbye. Everybody clap I mean, You for say Michelle. you don't have the time for it. I think we had a half hour phone call yesterday <laughs> just because <laughs> i was doing something at the same time but you know i've i've got to go do other stuff now 
But yep. thank you so much for being our guest, our third guest. Rob Palmer has been on here and we're going to have other guests and I need to find out who's going to be my next guest. And thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye everybody. All right.